Hi there. Welcome. My name's Anna Downs, um, and this is Dimmock's Chapter One. Um, I'm here to talk to you tonight about The Safe Place, which is my debut novel. Um, and I'm really grateful for Dimmocks for having me tonight. I'm really grateful to you guys for joining me here tonight and giving up some of your, your evening. Um, uh, I don't know if any of you saw my book launch um, that I did live on Facebook, but um, I had to say that, uh, you know, if you hear any strange noises or see anything odd, it's probably because my kids are acting up and they're not, <laughs> I don't think they're quite in bed yet. So they, they might be running around somewhere. So uh, it's worth <laughs> letting you know that in case it all starts to seem a bit odd. Anyway, um, so like I said, I'm here tonight to talk to you about The Safe Place, um, which is my debut novel. And it's a story about the discovery of a secret. And it follows Emily Proudman, who is a struggling actress and uh, her life is sort of falling apart around her ears. And she's kind of rescued from what she thinks is a gigantic mess by a very charismatic, very handsome, very um, intriguing, businessman who seems to be offering Emily the, the opportunity of a lifetime and that's a job working for and living with him and his family on their beautiful remote property on the west coast of France uh, and of course Emily jumps at this this opportunity um, but what at first appears to be a dream come true turns out to be something a very sinister indeed. Um, so I thought um, this is cool this time. It's a little bit um, different from the, the book launch that I did in that I can actually see some of the, the comments coming up. There's my sister, hello. Um, yeah, so uh, while the messages come up and while people join, oh, thank you, Yvonne, just finished this, so good. Thank you, that's very nice of you. Um, I'll just talk a little bit about, um, well, I thought I'd, kick off by saying that online events, hey, like they're strange and we've been doing a lot of them and it's quite unusual, but I'm, when I was first starting to write or when I first had the idea that I might try and start to write, I was um, going to all the workshops that I could find. I was listening to podcasts constantly. I was reading theory books. And, you know, while at first when the pandemic first kicked off, it, it all felt very scary and you know how are we going to do this and how how are we going to reach readers and talk to them and then all these virtual events started kicking off and I feel like you know the silver lining to all of this is that there's so much information at our fingertips and so so many author talks um, and I would have killed for this uh, level of access uh, when I was first starting out. So I really hope you find some of this useful if, you know, as a reader or if indeed you are yourself um, thinking about writing or if you're a writer yourself. Um, yeah, so uh, I'll just have, a ah, lovely. There's my mom. Hi, Danny, Paige. Christian's here. Hi, Christian. Um, Ah, oh, thanks, Danny. That's lovely. Um, all right, I'm going to get really distracted by all these comments. So I want to talk to you briefly um, about um, how I ended up writing. So I used to be um, an actor a long time ago. I grew up um, kind of raised on a diet of storytelling. Um, my uh, my mum used to take me to plays, to the theatre, to ballet and stuff all the time when I was little. My dad was actually a drama teacher at my school, so I sort of grew up um, on rehearsal room floors. You know, I spent a lot of time watching him rehearse and direct school plays. So I think there was a real love of storytelling that, that grew from that. Um, I fell in love very quickly with acting and um, I, I studied drama uh, at Manchester University for three years. And then I won a place at the Royal Academy of Dram Dramatic Art. Um, to study for three years, which was absolutely incredible. It was the most amazing experience. Um, but professionally, my life was, was uh, <laughs> there we go. Thank you, Tim. Here are some lovely pictures of me. That one in the middle, the uh, black and white one, is my old headshot, my first ever acting headshot. Um, on the um, 
I, I am, I think it's my right hand side, the picture of me with the hypodermic needle. That was my last ever uh, job that I did. And that was a fantastic production of a play called Quacks in My Skin by Phil Porter. And I'm playing a very disturbed teenager there. Um, on the other side, we've got um, at the top, uh, my appearance in EastEnders. I played Karen Jones in EastEnders. And then that rather scary one with the duct tape <laughs> is me in a show called uh, D.L. and Pasco, which was a, a, a detective show. And in that show, I played a, a very unfortunate zookeeper who became involved in a drug trafficking ring. Uh, and, and I forget her name now, but poor thing was chucked in a cage at the end with a, with a snake. Uh, but it was a great job. I got to work with tigers and giraffes and all kinds of things. It was probably one of my favorite jobs that I ever did but that that picture really is quite scary anyway so professionally uh, it, it, it was much 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 harder than I expected it to be the the trickle of income and the uncertainty um, and the rejection was all very very difficult and it kind of all came to a head to a point at which I um, I decided that I was going to take a bit of a sabbatical and go traveling um, and kind of take a bit of time to think about what I wanted to do while I was traveling, I met um, the man that I married. So um, yeah, I met Matt and we decided to keep traveling for a little bit. And eventually I decided I wasn't going to go back to London and to acting. I was going to carry on the adventures and see where they took me. And one of the places that they took me um, or took us working on a very beautiful and very remote property on the west coast of France, um, which obviously served as inspiration for the safe place. Um, this house was incredible. Tim's just putting up some pictures now. Thank you, Tim. Absolutely amazing. We, uh, Matt and I, lived in that big white house there. The family lived in the beautiful, what with the one with the blue shutters. Um, I'm not sure you can see it because I think my face is in the way, but there's a photo here of the grounds. It was just full of wild, there we go, full of wild flowers. Um, there were quad bikes and a tennis court and a basketball court. There was a zip line. Uh, there was an infinity pool and an outdoor kitchen and um, it, it was right on the ocean, but it was really remote. It was all the way down this um, forest track. And um, there were, I mean, the family themselves that we worked for, they were wonderful, fantastic people. We're still friends with them. Nothing awful or sinister happened to us while we were there at all. Um, but there was certain that there was a certain kind of atmosphere about the house that that stuck with me. Um, and, you know, the safe place is a, it's a suspenseful read um, and there is an atmosphere of menace that runs through it. And I think, you know, there were certain things like, um, so one time we were in that house, that white house, and a bat flew into the house and became stuck in the house and it was rattling around the house. It actually got stuck behind a mirror. So it was kind of bang, 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 bang behind the mirror. And it was like this mirror was, was kind of coming off the wall and banging. And that really stuck in my head. Also, as you drove down the path towards the house, um, there was like this, old abandoned it looked like maybe a scout camp or something there were about 12 completely abandoned wooden cabins and for some reason they completely freaked me out you know especially if we were going past them in the dark um so yeah little things like that there was also these huge storms that would roll in and anybody that's read the book might know that storms play uh, quite a big role in the book and so we would get these massive storms that would roll in off the ocean and I remember one night there was it was so heavy and that there was lightning everywhere and the thunder was crazy and the rain was so heavy it all kept because the, the property was on a slope and all the water came gushing down um, through the gardens and, you know, taking kind of plants and flowers and shrubs with them and creating this sort of torrent of kind of murky, awful water. And Matt and I ran out into the rain. It was, you know, pouring it down. And we were, we, we were on our hands and knees in the, in the sand on the driveway trying to dam up the water, the storm water, before it hit the pool, because then we knew we'd have an awful job trying to... Um, uh, trying to clean the pool um so yeah just being out in this this very dramatic storm like completely soaking wet trying to um 
stop it, stop the water. That was a big one. Um, and there's also this funny rule in France where um, if if you have a property that is, um, I don't know if it's nearby a uh, you know public ground or if if your property interrupts a public thoroughfare in some way, I'm not sure. But it then you know um, anyone can cross your property. You know, you, it's not really private property. They have right of way, so the public has right of way. Which was weird because this house was so sequestered away it was so isolated but every so often these random people would just show up in the garden and you know so you'd be sitting around by the pool and all of a sudden you'd look over and there'd just be like a dude standing there going oh sorry i got lost uh can you show me the way out kind of thing and obviously there were moments where that was a bit um terrifying um so that a lot of that might ring true to some people who have read the book. Um, thank you, Tim, for putting these pictures up. So um, here we have the, the pool area. Oh, it was so lovely. It was so gorgeous and joyful. And um, we had the best job there, really. You know, we'd, um, we just took care of the place and took care of the, uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly, how the other half lives. Well, it was very eye-opening in that sense. It was so different to anything that, that Matt and I had ever experienced before. Um, so yeah, it, it was an experience that really stuck with me. And um, years later, when I was looking for a creative outlet, but I had, you know, I'd, I'd given up acting, so I didn't have anything in my life. I kept thinking about that house and that experience, and I kept wondering if maybe I might be able to write something. Now at the time I had two kids under two and I was desperately tired and desperately um, looking for some kind of way to achieve that didn't involve purees and um, nappies and you know uh, tummy time, uh, something that I could do that would um, effectively give me some kind of gold star, you know, some, something that would remind me um, that I can I can achieve things and I still had a brain and um, I also didn't want to waste all the things that I'd learned and the training that I had um, I had done um, so yeah I, I started writing um, very tentatively at first uh, uh, just kind of fictionalizing some some memories and some scenes for you know actual scenes from my real life just kind of trying to figure out a few things and and just just try and get myself lost in in a scene they were rubbish those early scenes they were really bad um but the more i did it the more i enjoyed it and you know each scene sort of somehow stacked on top of each other and began to form not necessarily a story but but a character and a sense of something um and it all kind of clicked together one day when um I was thinking about a particular, I don't want to give away too much. I was thinking about something that I'd heard, a story that I'd heard. Um, and for some reason, it just clicked into place with this house. And I thought to myself, well, if I was at that house and I lived there, I was working there and I discovered that this thing had happened, what would I do? So that became the premise for this story. And God, I just, I loved it. I enjoyed writing it so much. It gave me so much pleasure. It brought me so much joy. Um, but then, you know, I'm I'm quite a driven person. So at, at some point I began to sort of think, well, oh, I wonder if I'm any good at this. And then from there, it sort of snowballed into a bit of an obsession. So I, I began reading theory books. Um, you know, Stephen King's on writing, um, Elizabeth Gilbert's on uh, Big Magic, um, loads, loads and loads of different ones. I started researching plot and structure, you know, craft, technique, how to actually write a story and build a novel. Um, I, what else did I do? I, I listen to podcasts obsessively. So it might not seem like you have any time when you have children, but like, you know, if I'm, I had this double pram and I would walk them around the neighborhood and listen to writing podcasts. Um, if I ever got the opportunity to go to the supermarket by myself, listen to podcasts, I would pop them on in the car. Um, I would listen very, very closely to, uh, 
to writers and try and figure out what their secret was. You know, what did they do? How did how did they get there? I did online courses. I did workshops. I entered competitions. I paid for manuscript assessments. I wrote short stories. Um, I read and 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 um, finally I had a first draft. Now I'm going to hold up here a pile of. <laughs> It's tricky. I hope I don't drop them. Oh! All right, this is a pile of my first draft, second draft, third draft, fourth draft. I've got notebooks. I journal everything when I'm writing. Um, just ideas, uh, plot points, things that I think are interesting, notes to self. Um, so I just wanted to show you that because uh, even when you done all of that research and you've 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 done your workshops and you've listened to your podcast and you've read all your books and you're, you're starting on your manuscript it's it's such a long process even after that you know you have to keep polishing and what I like to do is I like to print the whole thing out and ring bind it and then go through through it with a pen but put sticky notes on it as well with my notes so I'm not scribbling all over it necessarily I'm putting sticky notes on it so then I work back through the manuscript and every time I fixed a note or you know every time I fix something I take the sticky note off so I can kind of I can visually see my process progress visually see my progress as I edit um, so yeah that's that's how I how I do it and how I did it and I think I hope some of that is helpful in terms of helpful advice and tips and, and hints because like I said when I was writing or wanted to write uh, I was just hungry for all information I could get my hands on and try to figure out how people were were doing it. Um, I'm going to have a, a little <laughs> Martin Hughes, my publisher, says, show me the first draft. Never, never, ever. Um, <laughs> Fran Franca, great to hear about your writing process. Good, I'm glad you like that, thank you. Um, Lou Green, hi Lou, hi. Um, bought the safe place yesterday, thank you. Great opening pages, that's so nice. Thank you very much. Ah yes, there's Lou, sorry, I'm going off the little, the chat screen at the, uh, the side. Um, yeah, so I wonder, might there be any questions at all, Tim? Um, yes, yeah, Sarah, thank you. Really great way to make your way through your edits. Yeah, I find it really helpful. I, I find it really helpful if I can um, visually chart my progress because it, it feel when you're editing, my God, it feels like it's never going to end sometimes. And you can get so lost in the labyrinth of, um, you know, of the ideas and the, the, the threads that you need to put together and, um, and all of that. It can be really, really overwhelming. So, um, sticky notes sticky notes and planning as well like it, you know i often plan by putting up a huge uh, piece of paper on the wall and trying to map out my idea according to you know uh, trying to fit it within a uh, the, the framework of the three act structure um but i use sticky notes so that as i go i can take them down and move them around and um you know because uh, it's always fluid even you know if you think you've got the most watertight plan in the world you'll start writing and it will just go its own way so if you've got some way of uh, making that plan a kind of um a fluid moving ever changing thing as well as having you know being able to see that structure i think that's really helpful um oh some questions here oh would i ever attempt screenwriting yes i think i would um, i've never done any screenwriting before um but I'm really fascinated with it. I mean, I come from a stage background. I don't think necessarily, I don't think that The Safe Place is a, um, a particularly, I don't think it would work on the stage, but I do think it would work as a film. I don't, I mean, I couldn't write it right now, but maybe one day in the future, I'd love to have a, a go at screenwriting. That would be amazing. Um, I think I do think in, in scenes, I do write, um, you know, as I see things happening. So. I don't know, who knows? What a great question, thank you. Um, a firm press, hi guys. Um, oh, sorry, Lou, really interesting to hear about your editing. How much did your manuscript change from your first finished draft? And then after a firm had been through an initial edit. Yeah, it changed, it changed 
it, it's weird, it, it kind of changed quite a lot and not very much at all is the answer, Lou. Thank you for that question. Um, I One of the biggest things that happened was that one of the POVs was kind of uh, lumped in, in the manuscript um, as, it was sort of like it was supposed to be a story within a story. So in the first draft you got, um, and for a long time actually, and probably in the second and the third one as well, you got these two points of view that ran parallel and then about two thirds of the way through you had this big lump of just someone else's point of view that was you know um cast a lot of light on on what happened and um and the truth behind the situation um and one of the things that that the publishers did uh, not just a firm but minotaur over in the, the us as well is was we all decided that it would be better if that was broken up and then seeded through the novel which is a really difficult thing to do because obviously you can't just break up a chunk of writing and then drop it randomly each sort of each chapter has to be a natural progression from the one before but and it also has to inform the next one you know it's like dominoes so that was a really hard process but one that was really worth doing i think um there were other things that our characters got cut um there was a guy at the beginning who he was a very nasty character and he got caught. He was kind of irrelevant. He actually got replaced with a bus. So if anybody has read the book, they might know that Emily, Emily almost gets hit by a bus somewhere towards the beginning. And that, that was an encounter with a, a not very nice character. Uh, so there were, yeah, lots and lots of things and lots of, um, um, seeding of information, uh, what comes where, that was really, really helpful. Because obviously when you're writing, it's like it's like being lost in the woods um, without a map and your publishers are people that, that give you the map or that kind of somehow, it's a terrible metaphor really, but you know, somehow lift you above the canopy so you can actually see where you're going and where the paths are and then you can get back down in the woods. Um, <laughs> That's my husband, <laughs> Matt. Is it hard to cut or let go of a well-written scene because it doesn't suit the book? Yeah, thanks, Matt. Who's <laughs> in the next room? Um, <laughs> um, it is really hard. There was a, a couple of scenes that I wrote really early on um, that I thought were brilliant. There was a <laughs> an audition scene. Emily goes to an audition. Uh, where she thinks she's auditioning for a main part, and it turns out that she's she's really not. She's and it, it turns out to be quite humiliating, but in 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 quite a funny way. She she ends up auditioning for the part of uh, of an onion, and I wrote that scene, and I thought it was excellent, and I hung on to that scene for so long, even like right towards the end, and all the publishers were going, I think my editors, sorry, was were kind of saying, oh yeah, like it's it's great, but I really don't think it belongs here. I think maybe maybe we could lose it, and I was like, oh. And then finally, I realized that, yes, of course, they were actually right. Um, <laughs> so it is hard. It is hard. But you're more often than not, what happens to a suggestion or give me a suggestion. And um, it takes me about two days during which, you know, during which time I'm kind of outraged or I'm upset. And I'm like, no, that's a terrible idea. And then gradually I'll start to realize that they are, in fact, right. Um, and then I start to get excited about it because I can totally see where they're coming from and how it's going to make the book better. Um, Leanne Fry, at what point did you get an agent and what was that process like for you? Did you enter unpublished manuscripts comps as a way of drawing attention to your work? Yeah, I did. I did. I tried everything. Um, I, <laughs> I did a lot of things in a very short space of time. I knew that I wanted to send to agents. And I think really that... Um, Entering unpublished manuscript competitions for me was more of a way of uh, giving myself a deadline, giving myself a little shot of adrenaline. Um, you know, somebody might read this. And as soon as you think that somebody's going to read your work, you start to see it through different eyes. Um, and that kind of doesn't really work as a sort of practice, uh, you know, like uh, um, like an exercise, like a theory exercise. You have to really know that someone is going to read it. And then all of a sudden that changes everything. So, you know, if I have a deadline, if I know that some, someone's going to read it, it becomes a lot easier, uh, but also it, it's more exhilarating. You know, I know I have to get it right. Um, so unfortunately, my my entries into unpublished manuscript competitions 
they were rightfully unsuccessful because the material wasn't finished at all. Um, I was, I think I, I, I sent off, you know, um, submissions to those competitions knowing that my manuscript wasn't wasn't really ready but it helped me I don't know I probably wouldn't recommend doing that you probably should have a pretty decent manuscript before you do that but I did everything I, I um um and I got an agent by doing an online course about how to um uh, edit my manuscript edit my draft and then um pitch it to agents so it helped me to put a submissions package together that's really important knowing how to do that and also how to research um and you know use use the internet and the information available to find who might be the right person for you it's really important to try and find an agent that you think will be a, a, an excellent fit and who will understand your work and who will champion your work um, so I was months and months researching that and putting all that together um, and ended up with some oh, absolutely amazing people. So I'm really, really lucky. Um, <laughs> hi, mum. <laughs> what, what do you value the most from the online courses you did? Well, that, you know, um, I, I do feel like uh, the edit and pitch course was excellent in that um, without the information that that one gave me, I probably wouldn't have known how to uh, efficiently um, target and approach agents. Another thing that it did for me is that most online courses, uh, maybe not most, some, some of them have uh, student forums in there. So you're kind of, again, it's about having a deadline and having some um, accountability you know you 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 need to uh submit this chapter today because people are expecting it and they're going to feed back on it um so you 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 have people that feed back on your work which is obviously really valuable but you also uh get to feedback on their work and that's just as valuable as well in that it teaches you to support others as well as receiving support uh it also really helps you i think to sort out what uh, feedback you think is valuable for your stuff you know if you're you're giving particular feedback on somebody's work and there'll be a thousand other people not a thousand other people it's not you know the forums aren't that big there'll, there'll be lots of other people who are feeding back in different ways and picking out different things and I think you know it's important to remember that you don't have to take everybody's feedback and that um, not everyone's going to agree and you really really can't please everybody so that was something that was was incredibly valuable um and just have and have meeting those people and having them as beta readers so you know i would send my early drafts off to them as well and they were incredibly incredibly wonderful and valuable um hi a firm press hello uh hello anna was matt creeped out the first time he read the story seeing how you changed the french estate into something more sinister do you know what Matt didn't read the book until we had like an arc. He didn't read it. Um, I told him bits about the story. Um, and actually he, if I say, so for anybody that's read the book, The, the Big Storm, he helped me work that out. Like I had a moment where I, um, I was upstairs writing and I came downstairs and I was like, look, I've got this situation. I've got this scene. I really don't know how to work it out. I have th this thing has to happen, but you know, it's hard to talk about it without giving spoilers away. But anyway, he he helped me work that out. But he so he knew the storyline, but he and he knew I was writing about that property, but he didn't read it until it was finished. So I I don't think he was creeped out. I think that he was. Um, it was almost like walking through. Um, I guess it was like walking through a memory. Maybe it was like walking through a really bad, weird dream. I don't know. I'll have to ask him. Um, but I think it was it was a bit weird because I, I, you know, um, so much of it is fictionalized. So much of it's fictionalized. But obviously, I've used some details, some very specific details from the real experience as well. So, and I know. Uh, so the 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 real life woman that I work for, she's read the book. 
and that was one of the things that she said about it was that she found she found certain bits of it quite distracting because she she knew that I'd taken them from real life and from you know I'm not talking about the, the terrible sinister things I'm talking about things like you know meals that we made together and wine that we drank and um yeah things like that um hello I think that says Mariella maybe Mar yeah um, did you base your characters such as Emily and Nina etc and the family on someone you know or a mixture or totally invented hmm so Emily started out as me thank you for that question by the way thank you um Emily started out as me and she's the closest to me um but all of the characters in some way come from some part of me um, and I think they're, they're definitely not based on people that I know. Um, I think that if you if you start trying to fit people that you know into a fictional story, you'll soon find that the story throws them out because the story will kind of uh, take on its own life. Some authors, I think, talk about, you know, the characters talking to you and, and the, 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 the story having its own life. And that is that's absolutely true. But I think it's more... It's more for me that um, it becomes very apparent dramatically that certain things are going to work a lot better than they, than they are, um, you know, that, that they might do if you did X thing or, or Y thing, you know, if, uh, you, and, and if you try and um, shove in uh, somebody that you know, you'll soon be like, well, uh, unfortunately, you know, you, like you can't you can't use them in that situation because they wouldn't do that. So then you have to give them an extra layer and maybe that doesn't quite mesh with how you've set them up. So then you have to change them completely and then you end up with a completely invented character. Um, so I would say that I use myself or certain situations that I've been through kind of emotionally, emotional experiences as a springboard into either a story or an idea. Um, and then I go from there and I let the, the, the story in my imagination take me. Uh, and I, I maybe use other things like little ticks and characteristics and, and foibles um, from real life people, maybe just to color a scene or to add a little bit of extra detail. I really admire writers who use detail to great effect. Um, I think it can be very misleading, you know, a nice bit of detail. You can be like, oh, that's a strange thing to put in there. I wonder why they put that in there maybe that's significant and it, it may or may not be you know it's a little bit like um um if you walk into uh i think it, i said this uh not long ago to somebody I, I sometimes i see see scenes as like a room um and when you walk into a room what's the what's the most important thing that you want to see or not see do you know what i mean so sometimes those details can be little things that are hiding the big thing in the room that you maybe don't want the reader to see. Or sometimes those details can be shining a light on the big thing that you really want them to see. Um, so, sorry, I've gone off on a tangent. So uh, little characteristics and foibles that belong to real life people, um, I definitely use them to color a scene, but I, I, I definitely don't use real life people um as a basis for my characters i use more like my emotional reactions to people or situations and then build from there i hope that answers your question um i know you've said your background in acting but where does your love of storytelling come from that's a lovely question thanks Paige. um well like i said before at the beginning i I my 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 mum would take me to the ballet and to plays a lot when I was a kid and my my dad was a drama teacher and he oh he 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 loved reading me bedtime stories and putting all the accents on um, everything was about stories um, but I kind of grew up uh watching him direct school plays and um I was I was sort of always in the corner um just watching things unfold and he was the kind of person he didn't just want to do you know your your average school plays like Oliver Twist and Grease and and whatever he was doing Frank McGuinness and Kafka and Lorca and you know he was getting these um 
sort of 16 year old kids to um, perform and devise these incredibly powerful kind of gut wrenching, spine tingling pieces of theater. And I, I remember specifically uh, this this one piece that he did was called um, Children of Destiny, and it was a devised piece based on the Oedipus myth. And I was nine when he did that, so um, I would kind of go with him on a Saturday morning and sit in the uh, sit on the floor and watch them watch them do it. And you know these these kids, these school kids, performing brilliantly performing this story about a man who kills his father, marries his mother, realizes it has children with her, realizes what he's done and then gouges his eyes out. She hangs herself. And I'm just, you know, nine years old sitting on the floor going, this is the best thing ever. Oh my God, this is electrifying. And so I, I, I think that, yeah, my love of storytelling comes from that and, and, and being um, shocked in the most amazing brilliant wonderful way by story at a really young age and electrified by it um i hope that answers that question um lou hi again what advice would you give um or what have you learned about how to heighten tension in a novel um that's a really great question thank you lou um what have i learned about how to heighten tension what advice would I give? Do you know, one thing that really helps is short chapters. Um, I know that seems like a no brainer, but um, I always try my best. And I don't know why I've picked this figure up, but I always try my best to keep my chapters under um, 1500 words. It doesn't always work, uh, but I do try and keep them under that. I feel like if you can give yourself a limit, then you're more, uh, you're more inclined to, as I say, really zone in on that thing in the room that you either want the reader to see or you don't want them to see. Um, so yeah, f and, and keep in mind the purpose of the scene as well. Um, maybe, you know, quite often at the moment I'm, I'm writing something else and I'll often, when I'm starting a chapter, I'll outline, you know, like where's the beginning point of the scene? What's the end point of the scene? And what do I want to achieve in the middle? You know, I, I know it sounds a bit formulaic, but it just really helps me to uh, zone in on the important things uh, about what I'm trying to communicate or what I'm trying to achieve. You know, is it is it a particular atmosphere? More often than not, it's information. You know, what information do I really need to convey in this scene? And then the more your imagination roles with that and the more you can kind of build the scene around the information that then it, it just kind of comes to life in your head and obviously you know that can really take you off on lots of different tangents and you can start going oh and then what what if they go to a what if they go to a park and there's a there's a you know a, a, a bridge and maybe someone falls off the bridge and it's tech. but you know of course that's not the piece of information that you really need like that that falling off a bridge it might seem like a good idea to you but it's not actually helping you to convey the important information in the scene um so it just helps you keep keep on track um and uh what else in terms of tension um i would say that every chapter it's it's good if every chapter has some sort of cliffhanger that makes you want to turn the page so every single one every single one should have a kind of ending note that you can hit that that either you know begs a question or it just in some way makes you want to turn the page and find out what's what's happening. I would also say it's helpful if um, every single beginning line of a chapter is as good as your opening line. I, I often try and do that. I think I guess that's why I um, I when I'm starting to write one, I will uh, write down the top of the scene and the bottom of the scene, and then I'll try and work out how I get from a to be um and i think as well i like could quite often you can you can think of your chapters as as short stories i think that helps too um and i yeah i guess that i don't know if that helps with tension per se 
but I think it certainly does help with pace. Um, tension as well, I think, is about what, what you can what you can see and what you can feel um, if you drop yourself into the mind of your character, you know, showing, not telling, I guess. Um, Emma, hello, Emma. Do you have some favorite authors you like to read? Oh, well, as you might be able to see behind me, I, I, I read all the time and I read really widely and I have um, a million and one different authors that I love. I love so much. I while I've been doing um, these events and podcasts and stuff, there's a few names that have been coming up a lot. You know, I, I really love David Nichols and love Jojo Moyes. Um, I, I talk a lot about Christian White and and Josh Pomari, who are very inspiring um, writers, um, and I, I love their work. I also I, I don't mention Nick Hornby a lot. I really love his work. I just recently read a book by a guy called Paul Tremblay called A, a Head Full of Ghosts, which has really stuck with me. I keep thinking about it um, a lot. Um, Leanne Moriarty, I, I just love her. I can't get past her. She's amazing. Um, but also nonfiction writers like, um, well, I guess, you know, like three women I thought was so powerful. I think Lisa Tadeo is an incredibly powerful writer. I love Zadie Smith. Zadie Smith, I absolutely adore. I think she's she's so complex and deep and brilliant. And uh, I don't know if you've ever come across somebody called Jonathan Tropper. He's hilarious, um, an American writer. Um, I think he's so brilliant. Stephen King, Gillian Flynn. God, we could be all night. <laughs> <laughs> I could talk for hours. Alex North, great writer, great writer. Oh, last question. Oh my gosh, this has gone really quickly. Um, let's have a look. Oh yes, Three Women was fantastic. Yes, it was. Um, oh, Jenny. Hi, Jenny. Am I working on a second novel? I am. I am. I am. Um, I don't know why I said that three times. <laughs> I am. I am. I am. Um, I am working on uh, a novel that's nothing to do with The Safe Place or, or Emily or Nina or Scott. Um, I'm working on a novel. Again, it's a, a suspense novel. Um, and it's about two women who are living three years apart and on opposite sides of the globe. And they're both raising sons, teenage sons, who have in some way got involved with the dark web. Um, and who are causing a lot of you know dramas in their family life with this this um, this obsession with the dark web. One of them, her son, has started ordering mystery boxes from the dark web. And if you don't know what they are, I mean it's it's quite interesting. You can Google mystery box dark web, and the, the things that come up are really quite you know you can fall down a real rabbit hole, as I did when researching this book. Um, but they these mystery boxes are like. Um, I don't know if you've ever, ever seen unboxing videos on um, YouTube or whatever, you know, with, with girls who order makeup and stuff like that. Um, but these are very sinister, strange boxes that have an array of really dark and weird things in them. And they kind of, you know, maybe they, they look like evidence of some crimes or something. Um, you know, flash drives and, and um, weird photographs and phones and drugs and, you know, very strange assortment of objects and these youtubers film themselves opening them and lifting the objects out and they um they pay a lot of money for them um and so this son has ordered mystery boxes off the dark web she takes his devices away and makes sure that he can't order anymore but the boxes keep coming and um they start to contain objects that are very uh clearly um targeted uh you know that that the, the, they have things to do with the family like family photographs and, and things like that and it all starts to be a bit strange and odd so i i know that i've got to work on that pitch that elevator pitch is very long and rubbish and rambling but i'm still kind of in the uh the the slightly the, the sort of the dreaming stage of uh, of the writing and um, so i'm you know I'm just just working on the first draft at the moment but i'm really enjoying it and i'm really excited about the idea i really hope that it uh, translates well from my head to the page all right. Well, thank you so much for your questions. It's been so lovely this time being able to see all the comments um, 
coming up and down a firm press this mysterious second novel sounds brilliant yes well you would say that <laughs> thank you um thank you all so much for for joining me tonight it's been such a pleasure um i loved your book thank you diane oh that's so nice thank you thank you for for being here with me um i oh thank you thanks kelly thanks <laughs> um Hey, listen, if, if any of you uh, want to get in touch with me at any point, if you, you know, I always love to chat books. Um, I've got, you know, I've got, I'm on Twitter at what Anna wrote. Um, I'm on Instagram, Anna Downs Writer, or you can uh, message me through my website, anna-downs.com. Um, it's been so lovely hearing from readers and, and other authors. Um, during this whole process. So yeah, please do free, feel free to get in touch with me. Um, I will finish up, I guess. Nice to see you too, Glenda, thank you. I'll uh, finish up by saying uh, that the book is out in Australia now. It came out in um, the US yesterday, the 14th of July, and it comes out in the UK on August the 20th. The, uh, thank you, Leanne. The ebook and the audiobook are available. I narrate the audiobook if that's at all interesting or appealing. <laughs> um, and thank you, Sir Wendy. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Oh, good. Yes, go read the book. I hope you enjoy it. Uh, thank you so much to Dimex and the Chapter One team. This has been an absolute pleasure. Um, Oh, uh, please don't forget to watch the next chapter one event on the 21st of July with Julia Gillard. Uh, so thank you ever so much again. Um, it's been such a pleasure talking to you tonight. I hope you've picked up something useful or something inspiring. Uh, and I hope you also pick up the safe place. Thank you ever so much, everybody. Bye.